this is William Nguza. Allow me to present to you Mr. Hugh Abel, who is the registrar as well as the chairman of the UCT Retirement Fund. He will be highlighting the importance and the impact of the retirement reform post 1 March 2015. Good morning and welcome to today's UCT Retirement Fund Planning for Retirement Seminar. There are critical decisions that each of us faces as we approach retirement. And this seminar is intended to help us think through what those decisions are and make rational decisions about them. It's not just a question of what you do with your savings in the UCT retirement fund at the time of retirement. It's also about thinking about how you're going to live and your priorities in retirement, about such things as medical aid in retirement and how healthcare costs can be managed. And at the end, it's about death and your will and estate plan. So that's the purpose of the day. We hope that this seminar will help you come to the right decisions about these important issues that you face as you approach your time. Thank you. So let's start with retirement fund reform. The first thing I want to say about retirement fund reform is that though National Treasury seems ever to be in the news about retirement fund reform, I don't think any of us needs to worry about it. Retirement fund reform unfortunately creates panic amongst many people, thinking, oh, what's going to happen to my money? But I think we have, if not a benign, certainly a progressive set of people in the National Treasury who are working for retirement fund reform in the interests of people like us. And I think that's important. So what's on the agenda in retirement fund reform at the moment? You may, if you follow these, have heard about T-Day. Now, T-Day is not going to affect anybody here because everybody here is over 55. Um, T-Day, the 28th of February 2015, is a magic date after which one of the National Treasury's planned reforms starts. And that planned reform is one that I personally welcome, and I think most people do. And that planned reform is to try to ensure that people at retirement preserve at least two-thirds of their accumulated capital for a pension. In other words, don't go and spend it. But it doesn't affect you, uh, because on, after T-Day, um, the accumulation that people get in a retirement fund uh, will, to some extent, be preserved. In other words, you'll only be able to take out one-third of the future contributions after the 28th of February 2015 in a lump sum. But if you're over 55 on T-Day, it doesn't affect you at all. So the first thing about T-Day is don't worry about it, it doesn't affect you. The second thing about T-Day is I think it's a good thing. The retirement fund reform that's there is a good thing because it's looking at retirement funding as something that provides a pension, not a pot of money to go out and spend. The second uh, retirement fund reform, uh, which does affect all of us, um, most of us, um, is that the tax-free amount that you can take out at retirement has been increased to 500,000 rand. Now, if you are a member of the UCTRF who was a member of the old AIPF and you transferred your balance in the AIPF into the UCTRF, the amount that you transferred from the AIPF is added to that 500,000 as the tax-free amount which you can take out. If you've taken out money from another retirement fund pr previously, then of course that's a deduction against that 500,000 because the 500,000 is cumulative over all the schemes that you as an individual might have. So if you've matured some other f retirement vehicle at, and taken a tax-free amount earlier, then that will be deducted from the 500,000. Now, I think you need to think very carefully 
if you can take out 500,000 plus your AIPF transfer amount, which for some people who were in the AIPF, who'd been there for a long time, will mean it's a big sum of money, you've got to think very carefully about what you do with that tax-free amount when you take it out. So more of that later when we look at options at retirement. The third issue in retirement fund reform that comes into effect next year is that there's a change in tax deductibility. And again, it's going to affect very few people here, if any. And the essential purpose of this is to try to bring the tax treatment of contributions to pension funds and to provident funds into line. So what is going to happen next year is that if an employer makes a contribution to retirement funding for you, that will be deemed to be income in your hands for the purposes of income tax. But the contribution that is made to the pension or provident fund will be tax deductible in your hands up to 27.5% of the greater of your taxable income or your income, uh, whichever is the greater, um, or the maximum of 350,000 rand. Now, there are a few medical professors uh, for whom the 350,000 rand limit uh, might be an issue if they take the full um, if they make the full contributions to UCT retirement funding, but very, very few. Uh, the, there are people who have been making additional voluntary contributions who, who are therefore over the 27.5% uh, who will have to look at what they want to do next year. Now, if you're retiring at the end of this year, it doesn't make any difference to you. If you're retiring at the end of next year and you're in that category, you need to think about it. Again, it's not a train smash because... Although you are limited to a certain amount in terms of tax deductibility, what you can't deduct for the purposes of income tax in that year of assessment will be carried over to future years and will become a tax credit for you at retirement. So it's a question of, of uh, the extent to which you can save. Now, it's not, this is not a big issue, and it's not an issue for most people here, so I don't want to dwell on it, but I think, again... This is part of the, a welcome part of the tax reform because it is going to make the whole issue of pension and provident funds on an even level and will have one advantage for people at UC, joining UCTR uh, in future is that they'll be able to transfer into the UCTR from a pension fund which hasn't been possible up to now. They, you could only draw, transfer from a provident fund into UCT and you had to preserve in some other way. So that's an advantage to UCT. It's not an advantage that anybody here will be able to benefit from. The future retirement fund reforms, which are still in the wings, um, on T-Day, as I said earlier, a small part of people's earnings in retirement funds will be preserved. Treasury wants to go further with preservation, and the T-Day rule will only apply at retirement. It will not apply at resignation. At resignation, people will still be able to take out their money and spend it. Now, clearly, in the national interest, that needs to be addressed, but it's an issue at the moment. That hasn't yet become law. That's still a proposal. The second part of retirement funding reform, which is mooted, is a national retirement fund of some sort. And again, with the proliferation of retirement funds, there's a lot of sense in that, but it hasn't come about yet, and it may be some time before it is. The third one, which is much more important for our fund, is the notion that the advice in a circular which is known to trustees as PF130 as to what our duties should be is likely to become statutory. In other words, those are what our duties will be. And that will put yet more pressure and I think welcome pressure on trustees of retirement funds. I'm confident that the trustees of the UCTRF are adhering to the letter as well as the spirit of PF 130. So I don't think if it does become legislated, it will have any practical in in impact on the UCT retirement fund. Okay, that's just by way of introduction. What's more important to each of us is options at retirement fund, at retirement. Now, the UCTRF is a provident fund. Simply put, 
This means that it is a savings account, a savings vehicle, with some important differences from other savings vehicles, that aims to provide a lump sum with which to keep us alive in retirement. It aims to provide a lump sum. What are those important differences from other vehicles? Well, your growth in the UCT RF isn't taxed. That's cr critically important. If you are in other vehicles, your growth is taxed. The second one is that the lump sum is protected from your creditors. And the third point about the retirement fund is that it includes insured benefits which provide additional benefits if a person dies in service. Now, the structure of the UCT retirement fund leaves two important decisions in our hands. The first one is the level of contributions. We can all change the deemed pensionable amount. Um, most people here would know what the DPA is, but just in case there are one or two who don't, our pay structure is a, com a number that is called by HR the cost of employment. So that's the package value. And we can determine between 50 and 100 percent the percentage that is the deemed pensionable amount. If it's 100 percent, then the contributions that go into the UCT retirement fund are based on 100 percent of the COE. If it's 50 percent, which is the bottom that anybody can choose, the contributions that are made on your behalf into retirement savings are halved. So that choice is each individual staff member's, and you can see the impact that that will have on your retirement savings. Again, this is history for most of us. Uh, what we haven't done in the past, we can't undo. If we've been at 100%, we will have saved more. If we've been lower, we will have saved less. The second decision that is the members is, is investment choice, the four investment channels that are available. Then, at retirement, UCTRF gives you a lump sum. This gives each of us the most important decision we have to make in respect of this. What to do with it? Now, there are essentially three options. Take the money and run. And when you're 95, you will be in trouble. Unless you happen to have other sources of income, or unless you happen to have somebody who supports you, or unless, uh, well, you're very, very wealthy. But that's the first choice that you have. You can take the money and run. There's no compulsory preservation. I want to talk about the other two, which are the important ones. You can take a pension in the form of a living annuity, and you can take a pension in the form of a life annuity. Now, I'm going to assume that you know little about living annuities and life annuities, but for some, of course, this, this will be old hat. But what is the essential difference between a living annuity and a life annuity? They both provide a pension, but they are inherently extremely different. First of all, a living annuity essentially says, I've got that lump sum that at retirement, and I'm going to give it to a fund, and it, it could be an insurer, it could be a fund such as the UCTRF, and they will pay me a pension. But my pension is actually just my drawdown, as I determine, from that capital. They'll invest it for me, as I decide, and I will have the full investment risk. So, if investments are good, that capital will grow, depending on the extent to which I draw down from it. Now, the authorities, that is SARS, determines that you must, if you have a living annuity, draw down at least 2.5% a year, but that you may not draw down more than 17.5% a year. For reasons which I won't go into in detail today, but will be um, available later, and others are going to talk about this a bit, we wouldn't think that it would be prudent if you took a living annuity to draw down more than 5% per annum if you took a living annuity. Now, if you draw down 5%, and if investment returns in real terms generate 5%, 
then the capital is going to, to outlive you, however long you live, and there's going to be something for your surviving spouse and for your surviving dependents. But if you draw down 5% and the investment loses money, in other words, doesn't grow in real terms at 5%, the capital is going to be eroded. It might last you until you're 95. But if the capital, if the investment returns are poor, it might not. And that is one of the issues which you have to look at. Now, a living annuity is a good vehicle for some and is not an appropriate vehicle for others. But the point about it is a living annuity, the risk is yours, some decisions are yours, the capital is preserved. A life annuity, the essential difference between a living annuity and a life annuity is the capital in a living annuity is yours. In a life annuity, you say, right, I've got this lump sum. Actually, what I want is a pension. So you hand that lump sum over to an insurer, and the insurer guarantees to pay you a pension for life. And depending upon the contract you enter into with that insurer, the insurer guarantees not only you a pension for life, but a pension to a surviving partner should you predecease that surviving partner. But if you're both dead and there's still some money left over, the insurer keeps it. Because the insurer has taken on the full risk and the insurer is able to give a better deal to all the people to whom it offers pensions because it knows that some of them are going to die. <laughs> it is as simple as that. Okay. Um, I can't resist just giving you a personal anecdote about this, which I think illustrates very well what this means. Uh, my mother is 101 and a half. And my father died when she was 83. And he had a small pension. And the administrator of the pension fund said, well, you know, the capital's not very much. You're 83. I'm sure you want the capital. And offered her the capital and sent her a check for 5,000 rand as an advance on the 88,000 rand capital that there was in the fund. Now, if she was going to die in six months of that, it would have been the right thing for her to do to take the 88,000 rand. And she said to us, well, surely I must take this money. We said, absolutely not. You will not take that money. So now, 19, nearly 19 years later, she is in receipt of a pension. The insurer of that pension fund aggregates her risk over all the members. And she has a pension an annual pension in 2014, which is over 65% of the capital amount that it would have been in, 1980, in 1996. I mean, she's getting, therefore, a pension of over 5,000 a rand a month now. It isn't a great deal to live on, but if she'd taken the 88,000 rand and invested it, that is the difference between a living annuity and a life annuity. The one, the insurer guarantees you a pension and does it on an actuarial basis. And you, if you out-survive their mortality tables, you gain. If you don't, you lose. But I suspect in this room there are going to be 20 people who reach 100. That is the likelihood that there will be at least 20 of you who will reach 100. <laughs> if you're asking, it's probably not you. <laughs> but but who, who of us knows? Um, you know, it's, it's, it used to be a very rare thing for a UCT staff member to reach 100. Uh, uh, um, uh, the, the widow and former warden of Baxter Hall, uh, Mrs. Van der Ende, whom some of you may remember, will be 100 next month. And she's not the only one on our list, and every year we've got 
a person, one or two people who reach 100. So I think that's one of the issues that what you really have to look at. Okay, a little bit more about this. Within the next 10 days or so, each of those of you who retire at the end of this year will get from the UCTRF a somewhat daunting set of papers. And I want to say something about it and why, why we're doing it. That set of papers will give you a set of quotations for a living annuity and for, and for three different types of life annuity. It will be personalized to you and will be based on the lump sum value in your accumulation account in the UCTRF. But these quotations are not for you to take one of them. They are indicative and they are intended to help you think through these options. Is a living annuity appropriate for you? Or is a life annuity appropriate for you? And if a life annuity is appropriate for you, what type of life annuity is appropriate to you? And again, I can't go into all the details here, but there are some things which I think are important to know. Uh, when, in respect of a life, uh, a living annuity, an insurer tells you it'll be guaranteed for five years, what does that mean? Brenda says too short. No. It, a, a, a pension from a, a, a life annuity pension is guaranteed for your life, and it is guaranteed for your surviving spouse's life if you take a, a pension contract that provides for a surviving spouse. But when they talk about guaranteed for five years, or it could be for a, a longer period, what they mean is that if you, and if there is a surviving spouse provision, both die, say within the first six months, the pension that would have been paid to you is guaranteed for the five years. In other words, they'll pay out what would have been paid to you as a pension for five years. So that guarantee for five years isn't the guarantee that we will pay you a pension for life. It's something else. It's something in addition to that. I think it's just quite important for everybody to understand that because some of these jargon terms in respect of the industry are confusing. Um, the... The, the essential things I think that one needs to, to look at in respect of life annuities are the type of life annuity that is offered. And again, the details I can't go into now because we just simply don't have the time to. But you can get a life annuity that is with profits and you can get a life annuity that is inflation linked. And you have to look at these very carefully. If you are versed in these matters you'll understand it. If you're not, this is where you need a financial advisor. So the purpose of the pack that you'll get from the UCTRF with these quotations and quite a lot of jargon with it, which I hope we have rendered into intelligible English, is to start you thinking, if you haven't already gone down that path, on what you should be doing about the options, about dealing with your lump sum at the end of this year when you retire. Some of you will have done it already, but it is an important decision. One last thing. If you take a living annuity, the UCTRF offers a living annuity, but you can get a living annuity elsewhere. If you take a living annuity, and it may be appropriate for some people, and it will be particularly appropriate for people who plan to and who will be in employment of some sort for two, three, four, five years post-retirement, where they don't want to draw down very much of the capital, you can, at a later stage, convert the capital that you have in a living annuity into a life annuity. So you might want to say, right, okay, um, I'm 65, but for the five years, 66 to 70, I'm going to be working and earning. And therefore, I'll draw down as little as possible, preserving the capital. I'm confident that whoever I want my living annuity with, and it could be UCTRF, it could be an insurer, it could be one of the investment houses, will look after my money appropriately and it will grow. And then at a later stage, when I want a pension and I don't want to have the cons all those concerns, I can convert the capital lump sum that is mine in that living annuity 
into a life annuity. And at that stage, I can deal with all the issues about do I want a guarantee period? Is there a spouse who needs uh, to, to get a pension after I die, etc., etc.? That's an important uh, consideration for many people. Right. The next thing um, that I want to say is how do you make this big decision? And, and first, as I've said, the fund will help by giving you information, and that is the purpose of the quotations you will get. And you'll get a quotation for a UCT retirement fund living annuity, and you'll get quotes from three insurers that offer life annuities. And deal with, these will deal with the types uh, of, some of the types of life annuities that you, that you and your surviving partner, if there is one, gets a pension. Um, I've talked about the guarantee. I've talked about the possibility of this being with profits or inflation-linked. Um, there is one other little point that I want to mention, and it comes back to what I said about the tax-free amount. Now, some people who haven't uh, had as big an accumulation in the UCTRF and who transferred from the AIF, AIPF <laughs> may find that the bulk of what they've got they can withdraw tax-free. Okay? So I can withdraw that amount tax-free. Um, can I still get a pension? Yes. There are two types of life annuity. There's what is called a compulsory purchase life annuity, and there's what is called a voluntary purchase life annuity. And this is only relevant where you've got it, where you've withdrawn a significant tax-free lump sum and you want to buy a pension with it. Um, but in, in essence, if you get a pension, your lump sum in the UCT retirement fund goes to an insurer and there's no tax leakage at that point. In other words, the full amount goes to the insurer and your contract is with that insurer to give you a pension. The pension that you get will be income in your hands and it will be taxable income in your hands. So you'll pay tax on that as if it were part of your salary. So it's really part of your taxable income. On the other hand, if you take, if you have a tax-free lump sum and you go to an insurer and say, I want to buy a pension with this, and you can do so, you've got the amount tax-free. There's no tax leakage at that point. You hand it over to an insurer and say, give me a, a pension. That pension is taxable in your hands. Tax-free to tax. Ah, because it's a voluntary purchase annuity, revenue says that to the extent that the money that you, you draw down as a pension from that amount is part of what you had as tax-free amount will be tax-free in your hands. So the difference between a compulsory purchase and a voluntary purchase annuity is a compulsory purchase one, it comes untaxed from the fund to the insurer and the income that you get is taxed in your hands, if it's a voluntary purchase annuity from your tax-free lump sum, and any other money that you might have that you want to add to that, uh, that is yours and has already been taxed, then you buy a voluntary purchase annuity and the pension that you get has tax advantages. I think it's just important to understand that, and for some people, particularly with a 500,000 rand tax-free drawdown now, and the fact that some of us who were in the fund and had been at UCT prior to 1995 and therefore were in the AIPF have the additional tax-free amount that came over from the AIPF, this is the point just to remember. And it's a point to remember when you're discussing your options with your financial advisor. So I come on to the question of a financial advisor. I think it's important to understand that there are essentially three types of financial advisor. There's the broker, who's simply a broker, who's simply selling you something uh, for a commission. There's a financial planner and there's a financial advisor. Well, most financial advisors uh, will do a financial plan for you if you want them to provide a financial plan for you. What's the distinction? I think it's important that there is a distinction. The financial planner says, okay, what do you want to do in life? What's important to you what are your assets? Let's look at the whole financial plan for you and produce a financial plan. And that's what most people need. And the decision as to what you do with your lump sum, the tax-free amount and the accumulation account, 
is then derived from what do you want to do, what are your assets, what can you do, what's realistic. So the financial plan is essentially a prerequisite to making those decisions. There's a bit of alphabet soup here. Uh, phase, uh, FPI, and TCF. Phase, the financial advisors and intermediary services legislation. Nobody can give you financial advice or do a financial plan for you unless that person is licensed under the FASE Act. And it's important if you're dealing with anybody to make sure that they are. That's the first and necessary rule. The second one is there's draft legislation, but it's going to come very soon, about TCF, treating customers fairly. And this is very welcome legislation because it is legislation that forces financial advisors to treat customers fairly. There are a whole lot of things about it, and I'll come up on to one or two of them. But one of the most important was, ones is, in the TCF legislation, financial advisors must give you written advice. In other words, they must give you written confirmation of the advice you're giving, and you can insist on that. And the third one is FPI, that's the Financial Planning Institute. The FPI has a website, and all phase licensed financial advisors details are available on the FPI website. So, what do you do? Now, the UCTRF will not give you the names of people to go to for financial advice. The reason why we don't do so is that it would require us to do substantial due diligence on anybody whose names we were giving to you, because we would be advising you that this person was a sound and proper person to go to. So, some hints then about financial advisors before I conclude. There are a number of things which we would suggest, and in the, the communication which those who are retiring at the end of this year will get, together with your quotations, is a list of these, um, and some hints about what to do and what to look for and what questions to ask. But obviously, ask a prospective financial advisor what their experience and qualifications are. Second, make sure that they are phase licensed. Thirdly, find out who employs them. Are they independent or are they employed by uh, some financial house and therefore selling the products of that financial house? That's not necessarily just to disqualify them, but you just need to know that. How are they remunerated? How do they get paid? Are they charging you a fee up front or are they getting paid on commission? Again, you may prefer to pay them through commission because it doesn't, the pain isn't as immediately apparent. But, you know, that little commission that comes off time after time is may maybe bigger than what appears to be a big fee up front, the sort of fee that one's used to paying your GP or, heaven forbid, a lawyer if you have to get to one. <laughs> is the person listening carefully to you? Do they or does the person show that they understand your objectives? In other words, are they giving you advice tailored to what your needs are? Putting that differently, do you think they're interested, acting in their interests or in your interests? Um, are they giving you written material and written advice? Uh, are they explaining technical issues in ways that you can understand? And probably the most important one, Regardless of who it is, never suspend your critical, fa your critical faculties as to the character of the person advising you. <coughs> never suspend your critical fac faculties as to the character of the person advising you. Are you confident that they are advising you wholeheartedly and intelligently in your interests, placing your needs above their own desire to earn fees or commission? Now, you know, they're not all rogues out there, um, by all means. In fact, there's some very good people in, in the industry who will do that. But it's just important, if you don't have a financial planner, to think about those sorts of issues. The options facing us at retirement, to decide what to do with the balance in the accumulation account, the tax-free portion and the portion that is not tax-free, are daunting. 
um, and they are very important for every one of us. But we believe that from the fund's point of view, by giving you, those who are retiring this year, and we'll be doing it every year, I hope in future for people who retire, by giving you illustrative quotations about what a living annuity might do and what life annuities might do, that we will help you, together with your financial advisor, reach a decision in your interests. Thank you very much.